recommend. Okay. We'll go ahead and um, start the uh, start the meeting. Notice is hereby given of the regular meeting of the Board of Education of the Town of Westfield in the County of Union, New Jersey, at 6 p.m. on the evening of Tuesday, March 2nd, 2021. The board meeting will be held via an online platform, which can be accessed at the board tab of the district website. The meeting can also be accessed by phone at 1-415-655-0001, access code 120-131-2036. The purpose of the meeting is to transact the regular business of the board and any other business to come properly before the board. The board will move immediately into private session to discuss matters rendered confidential by state and federal law, including negotiations, legal matters, and the superintendent search. The public portion of the meeting will resume at 7.30 p.m. This is to advise the general public and to instruct that it be reported in the minutes that in compliance with Chapter 231 of the Public Laws of 1975, entitled the Open Public Meetings Act, the Westfield School Board on Friday, February 26, 2021, caused to be posted at the Office of the Board of Education, located at 302 Elm Street, Westfield, New Jersey, and delivered to the Westfield Leader, the Star Ledger, the Westfield Library, Town Clerk of Westfield, Tap Into Westfield, and Patch.com, a meeting notice setting forth the time, date, and location of this meeting. Members of the public will be allowed to make public comments twice during the virtual meeting. In the beginning of the meeting, the public may comment on agenda items only, and at the end of the meeting, the public can comment on any topic. At the appropriate time on the agenda, the Q&A window will be opened for public access. If you wish to address the board, please type in your name and address. Individuals who are calling into the meeting and wish to speak can touch star three to access the raise your hand function, which will notify a staff member that you wish to speak. When your name is called, a staff member will unmute your microphone. Each speaker is limited to three minutes. Please note that if any member of the public becomes disruptive during the remote meeting, the board president may mute the speaker's microphone. Continued disruptions may result in removal from the virtual meeting. Dana, can we have a roll call, please? Sahara, please. Mike Thielen. Mike, are you there? I'm going to just leave. I'm here. Okay. I didn't hear anybody call my name yet. Brendan Galligan. Yeah. <laughs> Brendan Galligan. Rob Garrett. Here. Here. Greg Nolig. Porto. Jonah Patel. Here. Amy. Here. Okay. Uh, Rob, would you lead us in a flag salute, please? I uh, will. Okay. Thank you. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of, the of the United States of America, America and to the Republic. To the for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, uh, I would like the board to approve the following resolution. Uh, resolved that the Board of Education move into private session for the purpose of discussing matters rendered confidential by state and federal law, including negotiations, legal matters, and the superintendent search, and be it further resolved that any discussion held by the board, which need not remain confidential, and the results of the discussion will be made public as soon as practicable. Could I have a second, please? Second. Yeah. Brendan, thank you. Um, all in favor, please say aye. Raise your hand. Aye. Aye. I think that's everybody that's here. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll now switch over to the private link, and uh, anyone who's watching will rejoin you at approximately 7, uh, at 7.30 for the public meeting. Thank you. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll go ahead and, and, and restart the other two. I think will join us as soon as they can. Um, portion of our meeting. Um, we've already done our roll call and our flag salute. Um, this is the point in the meeting where we usually all have announcements, but because we are meeting after only one week, there is only one announcement. So I will handle it. Uh, it is that the next meeting of the Westfield Board of Education will be held on Tuesday, March 16th, beginning at 6.30 p.m. The board will immediately move into private session with the public portion of the meeting expected to resume at 7 p.m. Uh, the meeting is expected to be held virtually. Instructions regarding remote access to the public portion of the meeting are on the district website at westfieldnjk12.org under the board tab. The complete agenda of the meeting will be available on Friday, March 12th, 
on the district website, also under the board tab. So, as I said, that's our only announcement um, for tonight. Uh, typically, at this point in the meeting, we would recognize the public for agenda items only, but uh, in the way that we did last week, um, I think it's probably more appropriate if we would uh, get um, Dr. Dolan's update first, and then um, we would take public comments on agenda items after Dr. Dolan has, uh, has completed her presentation and a few board members have a few comments to add at, this, at that point. Um, one thing I would like to just say at the outset of the meeting, it's not a formal announcement, um, but it, um, this is just from me personally, that I know last week's meeting didn't go the way we all would have liked. Um, and we had a lot of people tuning in for the first time and possibly the only time. And it's kind of regrettable that um, I, as our board president, wasn't better prepared for that. I know there was a lot of dead air time while um, we were trying to locate people and un unmute microphones for comments. Um, so I know it didn't look good and I know it was frustrating for a lot of people and I apologize for that. So we are trying to be um, more responsive to that and um, we hope that um, the information that you're here tonight um, helps add to the knowledge base. Um, and so without further ado, I will um, ask Dr. Dolan to give us a, an update, please. Thank you. And Brian, can you uh, share the presentation, please? Thank you. So, yes, it was just a week ago and uh, in the past week, the principals and I continue to work with the teachers and continue to work to more fully reopen our schools. But I have to start with 1 reminder that I think is pretty important. And that's the date of September 10th. September 10th was the first day we opened up our school this year. And there's actually a slide that says that. There we are. And that really is important to note because that means that our teachers and our principals have been in our schools with our students since September 10th. And people with good memories remember that was really not the case with the vast majority of districts. But our teachers and our principals, um, our teachers um, were willing to come in um, and our principals worked hard over the summer to make sure that we could go in. Our custodians and our secretaries worked hard over the summer as well. And we have continued to be in. And in fact, the only times we weren't in the schools were when the community spread was too high and it wasn't safe. But other than that, we were in because we do care about the education of our students. So what have we done since September 10th? And that would be, uh, thank you. Um, so honestly, key, all the mitigation strategies. It's something we don't take for granted, although we've been doing them since September 10th. Mask wearing. And during the summer, some of you remember that people were saying students were, wouldn't wear masks. Well, they do. They do wear masks, and and um, and students and adults wear masks because it's important. Physical distancing. We were able to accomplish that. It was a great deal of work. Hand washing might sound trite. It's not. Sanitizing, disinfecting surfaces. Our custodians and maintenance workers had to uh, learn new techniques, and they have, and they take it very seriously. Ventilation. We spent a great deal of time and some money. Uh, working starting actually last March to make sure our ventilation was going to be appropriate. Contact tracing, isolation, and quarantining all became things that we had not been experts in, but boy, have we gotten a lot of practice. So that continues, and it's important to reinforce that. And progress, we did focus on our students who have the greatest need. So we have brought over 300 students with the greatest need back for, um, for five or four full days, sorry, five or four half days um, because they needed to be in school. They were the ones who needed that the most. And we were able to do that safely following all the protocols. Addition regarding communication. So the COVID-19 hub is created on the website in spring of 2020. If you go on the district homepage or any of the school homepages, there is a white little oval that tells you, just click on here if you have questions about COVID. And there is a great deal of information there. In fact, some of the information that has been requested um, recently has been on the webpage since March or April or August or September. There's a great deal of information there. Please take advantage of that. Additionally, since the pandemic began, I have sent 58 messages to all parents in the district. I realize we're all busy and I don't think anybody reads everything that is sent to their inboxes, uh, but we really do try to keep people informed. We've had 13 school board meetings and we have addressed aspects of the pandemic and our school this school this year. Every one of those meetings, we've addressed mental health, we've addressed social, uh, social and emotional learning, 
we've addressed how um, we are focusing on our curriculum this year. All of those meetings um, are on the website should people want to watch them. Additionally, at the end of each meet, after each meeting, I send a synopsis because I realize not everybody has the time to attend board meetings. You're all busy. Um, so we try to communicate in a number of different ways. So one question we heard, well, you know, why hadn't we opened our schools earlier for more in-person learning? So if we look at the data, which is on the next slide, you can see it just in our town of Westfield, because right, what does the governor said? The governor has said decisions have to be made at the local level about the opening of schools because situations are different by town, by community. So you can see how, as the experts all predicted, once we got to Thanksgiving, we started seeing more numbers because people were gathering. And once we got to the December holidays and then after the December holidays. And so you, if you've been paying attention to the mayor's notes, because she's very good about sending out information to the community, she has been reminding people, we have to be careful and we have to pay attention because our numbers really went up. And I've been saying the same thing in my messages. We have to pay attention. It does matter what we do. And as has been related in a number of town uh, missives, um, that January number with 490 people who were positive in the town of Westfield, 24% of those people were school-aged children. That was not the time to reopen the schools more fully. It just was not. I understand the frustration. I understand we all want the pandemic to be over, but that was not the time to open the doors. It might've been the time for other school districts and some of them did, but it was not the time in Westfield. You can see in February, the numbers are down. Are they down as much as we would all like? I don't think so, but they are absolutely down. And, um, and there's another trend and we have gotten more advice from our medical experts. So now we are looking forward more and trying to see what we can do to welcome our students back more fully. So with that, the next slide focuses on the elementary schools. After having listened to our medical experts and followed their um, somewhat modified guidance, on March 15th, the parents have been notified that the students in kindergarten through second grades will be welcomed for five days. They're being welcomed back at the existing schedules. Whatever their schedules are now in the hybrid schedule, it's the same schedule. Similarly, on March 22nd, the following week, students in grades three to five will be welcomed back. The principals are communicating specific scheduling, scheduling information and health and safety protocols and other details, and they've been hard at work at preparing those. So we are working towards that. The intermediate level. So last week, a survey was sent to all intermediate school families asking preferences for in-person or all remote learning, plus um, any, a proposed change to Wednesday schedule. Based on the results of the parent surveys, and parents were great at getting their responses back, on March 10th, students who are in grades six through eight, who are part of the hybrid schedule, they'll begin attending a morning session of in-person instruction on Wednesdays, and cohorts A and B will rotate, and the principals will send out the schedule for that. So that starts March 10th, which is a week from tomorrow. On March 15th, we're going to be able to welcome back all students who are receiving special education services, and they will be welcomed back for five days of in-person morning sessions. And then April 12th, students in grades six through eight will be welcome, all students in six through eight, whose parents choose to send them into school will be welcomed for five days of in-person morning sessions. If you've noticed both at the elementary level and intermediate level, we're doing this in a rather uh, progressive way, bit by bit. That's intentional. We want to get this right. We want to do it right. And um, this is intentional. Again, the principals have already communicated some information, communicated some information, but they will be communicating more to you. And then the high school level. At the high school level, starting on February 5th, um, students, all students were offered four mornings of in-person instruction and um, afternoons and Wednesdays remain all remote. Uh, we're very happy that we have just about 500 students who are attending our high schools. Um, we're glad to have more students in the building. It really does make a difference. And, um, and we're glad that that many students have chosen to come back. Other parents have chosen to keep their students remote and they're working uh, from their homes. In the next few weeks, the high school will be reaching out also with a survey um, to get a sense of how many students will be returning fourth marking period, very key. And then, as you can imagine, it, it will depend on how many students are coming back, how we can schedule. High school is very different from any other level. 
And uh, we're, we'll be asking those questions soon so that we can make plans regarding that. I was glad to hear yesterday that Governor Murphy said the same thing that's on this slide. We plan to welcome all of our students back for full day in person instruction in September. That is absolutely the plan. While we've all learned over the past year that we do not predict the future, if everyone continues to follow all the guidelines and guidance and take things seriously, the governor announced yesterday that he anticipates that we will have our students back for full day in person instruction in September. So, what are some of our ongoing steps? It was just yesterday, although it seems longer ago than that, that the governor announced that um, educators are going to be eligible to receive the vaccine beginning March 15th. Now, anybody who's been eligible in New Jersey to get the vaccine since, uh, I don't know, January knows it's not all that easy. You can be eligible, but that doesn't mean you can get yourself an appointment. But we're very happy to hear that. Uh, we know that our Westfield Regional Health Office is tr going to try to work with us. We would love to be able to offer the vaccines to our staff members in our buildings. And uh, we're hopeful that the um, Westfield Regional Health Office uh, will be able to do that. I know they want to, so we'll be looking forward to that. We're going to continue to monitor the guidance regarding lunch in schools because as recently as last evening, the guidance is uh, you can only have lunch if you are able to maintain six feet uh, distance with proper ventilation, and we are not able to do that in the schools. Uh, but we'll continue to see what other guidance comes. We will also, as the weather gets better, we can explore expanded space outside for instruction and possible lunch. But honestly, we can do that, and it works sometimes as long as the weather cooperates, and hopefully it will do that as we get further into the spring. And we certainly will continue to work with local and state health officials regarding COVID metrics and protocols. For those of you who have asked where the COVID metrics come from, they come from the health officials. They're the ones who provide the metrics and we follow the metrics and we follow them regularly. Last week, we heard a bit about, uh, we loved hearing that people were offering, what can parents do to support? Parents want to support. And I will tell you that is the tradition in Westfield. Our parents, for years have been very supportive of our students, of our teachers, of our schools. So here are just a few examples of how you can do that. Um, please work with the existing structures. Our, our PTC is the Parent Teacher Council. It's sort of the umbrella organization for all of the PTOs. Every school has a PTO or a PTSO. Um, even during the pandemic, those parents who are involved in PTOs have been working really hard to try to find ways to support our students and our community. Um, so please work with them, work within that structure. Those organizations already work closely with the principals and they know the needs at the school level. Uh, the second part is very important. Continue to follow all COVID-19 guidelines, including travel and quarantine. The travel, um, the travel requirements for quarantine were sent to all parents on Friday and they are also posted on that COVID part of our website. Uh, so if you are unclear, please look it up. It's very detailed. It has changed. Along the lines of that, tomorrow I'm going to be sending a short survey to all parents. It is short, I promise you. It's a one-day survey, and I'm, I'm asking about what are people's travel plans um, during spring break, because that is going to impact our students after spring break. So please look for that. We will send it out early morning, about 8 o'clock. It's very short, and we look forward to hearing um, finding out what our parents are planning for spring break. Another way parents can help is either yourself or other people you might know, encouraging them to become a substitute teacher or perhaps a substitute paraprofessional, perhaps a secretary or a custodian. We need all of those positions. As you might imagine, staffing is rather challenging during the pandemic, and we have been working on this constantly throughout this year. And a, another point parents can do I wouldn't mind if you advocated at the state level for clearer school reopening guidelines. Here's a fact. It was said that it's different. School reopening is different at every community. Well, it is. It has been. And one of the results of that is in community after community after community, there are meetings like we had last week where people try to compare themselves to other districts and where people are not happy. That's not a way to go. So if anybody is interested, I would suggest that you advocate at the state level because we need clearer school reopening guidelines so that all the schools are doing the same things. I think that will benefit all the students 
in our state. And just a reminder, we really do have quite a few resources. Uh, again, a number of questions we've gotten, uh, we've received recently, the answers are already on the website. Any of the superintendent weekly updates are there. Frequently asked questions, we attempt to um, update. It's not every week, but we try to do that regularly. Uh, travel and health protocols, as mentioned, are there. Technology tips or digital tools for families, mental health resources. Uh, there is a one page quick links. So if you're looking for information, it gives you all of those links. Uh, you can go to the main page of the district. You click on departments, go to school and community relations, and you find the quick links. You could also just put quick links in the uh, search button on the top of the page and we'll get there. So please check out the web website if you have not, westfieldnjk12.org. Check our Facebook and also uh, subscribe to our Twitter. Uh, we really have been working. We want our children back. And we want to do that safely because that's the only thing that is guiding us is making sure that our children are coming in and they're going to be safe. I hope that update uh, provides some information that people were looking for and um, I'll turn it back over to our board president. Thank you, Dr. Dolan. Um, that was really helpful and I know um, it, it having it available in that kind of format and readily available on the, the board website will hopefully be a good resource for people. It was one of our concerns as we were kind of digesting um, how last week went is that um, I think during pandemic life, a lot of people, uh, you know, open their laptop, start a meeting, have to turn around and deal with a child or a pet or something like that and turn around and may have missed some vital information. Um, and so certainly the videos are available. The synopsis um, after the meetings that you send out is very helpful for people. But this is another kind of a visual reference point that uh, hopefully people will find um, find useful um, and again able to share with with friends uh, if they need to. Um, on that note, if I just could before we open it up for the public, um, uh, Br Brendan Galligan, the vice president, and myself and some of the other board members had had um, conversations over the past week talking about what kind of message we might want to add onto yours. Um, at tonight's meeting, um, just to clarify our position about the nature of the work that we do. I think you, um, you hit upon it pretty well there. Uh, the more we compared the types of slides we might present and the types that you were already including in your presentation, there was a, a high degree of overlap, which is kind of a good thing. Um, talking about the different board committees um, that our various members serve on, how frequently and how consistently we've been meeting, even since the pandemic. Um, Someone like me who'd never done a Zoom meeting before, I'm getting much better. Um, uh, but so at the end of the day, there was really just one um, one additional slide of information that um, Brendan and, and Rob Garrison in particular thought might be helpful if we could just put back up on the screen for just one moment. It's the only thing where there was really um, a, a sort of some additional information that we thought was helpful. Um, Rob, do you want to? chime in on this at this point or Brendan, I'm not sure which one of you want sure. to speak you know, first. I'll, I'll definitely jump in and I appreciate it. And, and sure. I want to start off by saying that I, I'm really thankful and grateful for Dr. Dolan's leadership uh, as well as Megan Avalon. I know that there was a public, uh, a board of health meeting last night where Miss um, Avalon um, reiterated the high standards that we in Westfield have been following from day one through Dr. Dolan's leadership. The state, uh, and I'm pretty much quoting this, somewhat paraphrasing, um, in their direction to districts, they state that school districts have an obligation to ensure the health and safety of their students and staff. And the way they do that is through putting out minimum anticipated standards and additional considerations. That's the vagueness that Dr. Dolan uh, spoke of earlier. And so, instead of just following the minimum and anticipated minimum standards, um, when you look at the additional considerations, it states that in addition to general guidelines applicable to all districts aligned with the stages of reopening, each school must, uh, each school plan must uh, be in accordance with local conditions and resources. And that was important when you looked at one of Dr. Dolan's slides that showed the number of COVID cases. And, and really, when you look at what a district can and can't do or should and shouldn't do with the guidance of state, county, and local health officials. Um, it's really based on what's going on in your town at any given moment that dictates what you can and can't do. 
Um, but to complement and supplement some of the comments or some of the slides that Dr. Dolan uh, presented, uh, you know, I'm in a unique position on the board in that um, not only am I starting my sixth year on the board, but I'm also the only board member that's participated in all of the restart committees uh, that have been um, uh, that have taken place in the district. And so what I wanted to touch upon in a few minutes is really to go through and talk about some key dates and some key moments in time for us as a district, as well as um, the state. Uh, and, and I want to start with January 19th, because that was a, a seminal moment occurred when the New Jersey Department of Health announced the modification of school quarantining uh, guidelines, uh, expo exposure threshold, where it, it changed from the idea if there is one positive case in the classroom, everyone, including the teacher, had a quarantine for 14 days. And it went to quarantining for those um, within six feet for 15 minutes. And, and why is that important? It allowed the district through Dr. Dolan and, and her also and also the other committees that she has set up to um, go from a number of opportunities or possibilities rather that the school district can do in terms of looking at expanding the reopening to really focusing now at looking at um, how we can open that um, really falls within these new quarantining uh, rules. And but it's not alone. It also had to be, we had to look at this and I'll go, I'll talk about this in a few, uh, two points down, two dates down, but it still had to be, um, we had to look at and wait for the much anticipated uh, and the clarifying CDC guidelines. Um, one date that's not on there is that we had a special meeting on February 4th uh, and that was one of the first times where we had, uh, in the public comment period, parents talk about um, the need to look at and to find out from the district what our expansion was in terms of reopening the classrooms to in-person in uh, uh, lessons. So the very next day on, on uh, February 5th, the superintendent acknowledged that. The superintendent sent out emails to parents as part of her, uh, her weekly superintendent message talking about what the opportunities are in terms of what we need to look at. Um, and really, again, stressing upon the importance of waiting for guidance and clearance uh, from the CDC. So thankfully, a week later on um, February 12th, the CDC updated guidance to help leaders, uh, school leaders decide how to safely bring students back into classrooms and keep them there. The, these, this information was measured data driven effort to expand on the old uh, recommendations uh, that advise school leaders on how to layer the most effective safe, safety precautions. This is what Dr. Dolan mentioned earlier in terms of masking, physical distancing, hand washing, ventilation. Uh, and also, it's the first time where the CDC recognized that vac vaccinate, uh, vaccinating teachers in a, is an effective, uh, effective layer. Uh, and I do want to thank Brendan Galligan because Brendan serves as our rep on the school board association. He also has a leadership leadership role within the school boards association where they were key in, in putting out resolutions to school boards and others to urge uh, Governor Murphy to look at uh, putting teachers into that um, category of, um, of necessary uh, folks that, that need to get um, vaccinated sooner rather than later, which again, Dr. Dolan um, stated that that is now beginning on March 15th. Um, so as the CDC revised their, their uh, classroom guidance, um, that same day, Dr. Dolan sent out a message to parents K through eight, asking them to commit to hybrid or all remote learning through April 19th. Now, why was that important? as part of looking at the expansion of reopening the district, it was important for the district to understand and get a sense of where parents were uh, in terms of the hybrid all, all person remote. So it wasn't a survey, it was asking directly parents, if you are looking to change from hybrid to all, in per, or to, uh, all remote or vice versa, please let the district know and, and change that so that we can plan accordingly with these new CDC guidelines and with the quarantine guidelines on what the school could or couldn't do. Uh, and that was Friday. So by the following Thursday, the restart committee met where Dr. Dolan went through very thoroughly what she was going to recommend uh, and advise the district to do uh, in accordance with conversations with uh, Megan Avalon, with the county, with the state. And, and so, that's where um, the decision was made to start the slow rollout on reintroducing the students in an expanded way into 
uh, five days a week, uh, half a day for the various grades. And so by the next school board meeting, January 23rd, Dr. Nolan did in fact announce what, what we were doing uh, in, in grades K through 12 with the expanded five days a week, half a day's operation. And by February 26th, uh, the superintendent then announced the changes for learning through for grades uh, three through five. And so here we are March 2nd, and as Dr. Dolan mentioned earlier and even announced earlier, even further expansion in terms of what we're doing beyond the elementary school levels. And so again, uh, I want to thank Dr. Dolan for her leadership. Uh, Amy, you as well. Uh, I, I know the amount of time that you've put into this, uh, Brendan, and, and, and the rest of the board members as well, and the central staff, administrators, principals, it could, we can go on and on and on. Uh, but it, it's something that, um, you know, I'm really, really proud of this district. I'm, I'm very thankful for, for Dr. Dolan and for um, the, the time and the commitment that the rest of the board members have put into this, and as well as parents. It's great to hear from parents. I know that sometimes it seems like perhaps uh, we're not listening or maybe we're not responding right away. But rest assured that that we spend a lot of time uh, looking at this and and it has been uh, my pleasure to serve on the board uh, during this difficult time as difficult as it is. Uh, you know, it's meant a lot to be part of this and and um, I appreciate all of the uh, support. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. That, uh, uh, thanks for walking us through that additional timeline. It, it's interesting, of course, when you when you see it all laid out again. What feels like it's been a really long year has actually been um, <clears throat> kind of compressed there. Uh, there's been there's been an awful lot happening in the last six weeks, um, and even in just in the last week, even since since we all met. Um, and certainly, you, uh, the board and Dr. Dolan want to be responsive to the concerns of of uh, of the public and of parents. But there is there is a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes, um, and um, and I know that Dr. Dolan prefers to. Um, doesn't like to float theories, uh, theoretical options. She wants to be more certain, and um, and so we're thankful that the extra time has allowed for that certainty, which has been really helpful. Um, was there any other board member that wanted to to make a comment uh, yeah. before we go to public? Uh, yes, Brennan. Uh, thank you, Amy. Uh, you know, as part of the board's leadership team, uh, I want to say that you know we're perpetually seeking to do better as a board and as a district. Uh, and simply put, you know, my own perspective, uh, last week's public comment section really made it clear that we had not done enough to explain the board's position and our support for Dr. Dolan's reopening plan. Um, just speaking for myself again, it's clear that we may have taken for granted uh, the sort of institutional knowledge that we've acquired through various time on the board and working with the district and you know, we, we failed to communicate outward and I'm, I'm taking responsibility for my part in that and I want to do better. Um, as Rob touched on, uh, we've had, uh, as a board, we've discussed virtual versus hybrid instruction, and it's in varying capacities at all 21 board meetings since we were ordered to close our schools last March. Uh, we've sent liaisons to the district's parent teacher council and the PTOs of every school to relay information and listen to parent concerns. Uh, at the board committee level, we've held no fewer than 34 committees uh, where some aspect of the agenda was whether it's reopening or hybrid instruction, purchasing technology, um, or different tools to help make hybrid instruction uh, more useful to the students. Uh, it, simply, we're not, nor have we ever been in the dark about the district's reopening efforts, uh, but we have failed at communicating some of our knowledge uh, to, to the public. Uh, we uh, stand behind Dr. Dolan's decision to phase in the transition from hybrid to a more in-person to more in-person classroom time. And if I can take a second to congratulate Dr. Dolan, last year during the middle of the pandemic, the New Jersey Association of School Administrators elected Dr. Dolan to be their president to help guide all districts through through the pandemic. Uh, that's not something that we, we don't like to pat ourselves on the back here, but she does deserve recognition for that. Uh, I'd also like to take the opportunity to publicly thank all of our district staff for going above and beyond the call of duty over the past year. Our staff as well as the, the associations that res represent them and I do see several of the leadership team in attendance have been nothing but professional collaborative and cooperative. As we work to figure out the best path forward their willingness and eagerness to return to the classroom has made our path towards. Fully reopening possible. Uh, thank you for bearing with us over this last year 
and we do look forward to the return of normalcy by September. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. Um, Sahar, one of our new board members. Yes. Hi. Um, thank you very much. So first, I, I just want to let people know we have 289 participants, uh, because I know that the part, the, the people who call in can't see, which is uh, wonderful in terms of parent engagement. And I, I can speak on behalf of myself and others can agree if, if they choose, but we were very um, welcoming of parent engagement. And we think that we, the parents are partners. And I think it's important for everybody to know that we all are working together to try to solve these complex problems. Um, and I also want to thank Dr. Dolan and the staff for all the work they've done. I think this this uh, report today was very uh, detailed and helped to under to give us the facts behind and the time uh, the time span or the timeline for how we got to where where we are. So uh, I just want to acknowledge that. I know there are a lot of other questions, which hopefully some of the parents will raise today. Um, and, and Dr. Dolan, you can feel free to answer. Uh, I, I'm just going to ask two questions that I know are going to be asked because I've heard them so many times. So I just wanted to see if you wanted to take the opportunity to answer them now, or you can wait for parents to ask them because I'm, I'm pretty sure they'll be asked. Uh, the, the first one is the issue of expanding the day to five hours uh, and having two snacks because I, I think we've seen that a lot. And so you might want to answer that question. I think the lunch. Your explanation about why we don't have lunch is, to me, at least very clear and, and reasonable and appears to be based on the science. But I know there's been uh, parents who are trying to get as much time. You know, they want more in person time. Uh, and then the second one is the question about kindergarten. I think we've seen that question a lot. It was asked last week as well, which is uh, whether it can be four hours like the rest of the students, uh, the other, the K through uh, 12, or excuse me, first through 12, as opposed to, I think it's currently two hours. So again, an opportunity for you to just clarify that and perhaps save us some time because I've seen that question a lot. Um, and, and then finally, I just want to tell parents because another question is coming up is the issue of learning loss. And as someone who's on the curriculum committee, I know that we are addressing that. We have a meeting coming up. Uh, that is something that um, you know, you're, you're going to get more information on that. It is a process, but I can tell you, I can speak as a parent of three kids in the school district. We are all concerned about whether there is learning loss, to what extent there's learning loss, how do we remedy any learning loss? So please know that that is absolutely on our radar. Uh, and again, I'll defer to Dr. Dolan uh, and her staff when they want to give us the details, but I know that the board is, is actively engaging uh, in through our committee. Okay, thank you. So just briefly, um, so I guess what I would really ask is if I could ask parents, I know it's been a long year, but if you could continue to be a bit patient, just getting students in the building five days a week on the current current schedules is truly a challenge. It's a logistical challenge, right? Um, so if you could give us patience, let us get the students in for five days a week, and then sure, we can look at the timing and see what else is possible. But it, but it, but there truly are a lot of moving parts. Um, I, I know last week some people didn't think that was the case, but there are when you're when you're bringing in whatever it is, 400, 800 students into a building. And you're doing it safely under completely new rules, and the students don't just come in and sit in a seat all day, right? There are a lot of different programs that have to take place. There are a lot of moving parts. So if I could ask you to be to be a little bit patient, let's get everybody in safely. Let's look at that, and then if there are other changes we can make, we can certainly consider it. Um, and that includes kindergarten, it's kindergarten as well as the uh, as well as the other grades. Uh, just be a little bit patient, um, and uh, we'll continue working on it. But there are only so many things. There are only so many things we can do well as we're trying to move ahead with this. Thank you. Um, were any other board members want to make a comment at this point or? Hey, may I just have a couple of just general questions? Uh, the, the half day yeah. that we're going to have for like the, the elementary and intermediate schools, uh, we mentioned how we're going to uh, just have it in the morning and because of the lunch, we have to end it uh, after four hours. Are we going to reorganize the classes in any way? So we're focusing in on the core curriculum of the reading, science, math, and so on. And then I, I, know, I know we have to offer gym and classes such as like that. But I, following up on that learning loss comment, a lot of parents seem to be concerned with 
getting the core curriculum in in person versus the courses that may not necessarily require the in person instruction as much. Right. Um, in, in general, we are uh, keeping the program for a given grade in place. So, if we generally think that um, the fine arts or Spanish are important in fourth grade, then we believe that that's important um, in, in a lot of ways. It is part of a full education. That's why we bother to teach them in a regular year. Um, and I would also say, and I know at least some parents agree with me on this, because uh, I know they've seen some of the same videos of our students. Um, sometimes the arts in particular can really help with everyone's SEL, right? And if we're going to say we think that this is important, that's another way we can address that. It's not the only way, but it's one of the ways where our students can be kids even during a pandemic. They're also learning about music and art, um, but but it also is addressing some of their SEL. So um, at this point, we are continuing to provide the full programs to students not to take some of the courses away. Of course, there are some adjustments. Nobody has to tell me that. Of course, there are so many hours in a day, but we are trying to address all the programs. In regard to the learning loss, so the state of New Jersey, some of you might have read, have come out with the state is going to require state, uh, sorry, the state is going to require districts to report on assessment data that has already taken place. The, the details of that are um, still vague at best. So um, I know Mr. Panera, our assistant superintendent for curriculum has been working with the supervisors and they await more guidance from the state so that we can start to determine what it is they are looking for at this point. And we'll certainly keep both the board and the public uh, apprised of that. Okay, and another question that was commonly asked is related to lunch, obviously, and because that affects obviously a full day. And, uh, you know, we talk about like the, um, the health department and their guidance and they just want to understand as far as because uh, a message was posted as far as the CDC guidance if we have fewer than 50 new cases per 100,000 people so if Union County has approximately 500,000 people that we 250 from a metric standpoint where are we today as far as are we at a thousand are we at a hundred just trying to give some perspective to people that see that number how close are we from to get offering lunch or is this we're much higher than the range and that's why we can't really consider it at this time. Okay, two, two points. One, I can tell you, um, I mean, a, a lot of you might have followed the de uh, Department of Health meeting last night that was on zoom or you might have read about it today in um, the online uh, media sources. Um, and, and the discussion was held about lunch and it was just very clear that right now that is the guidance. The guidance is that lunch is a high risk activity. But Mike, I will bring your question um, to the medical professionals uh, because I'm going to see them as part of the restart on, um, on Thursday. So I can ask you uh, ask your question at that point. Yeah, I see this referenced often that because they say 50 for uh, 100,000 people. And then when we're in the hybrid mode, it is uh, what is it? I'm missing it here. The students and other. Oh, it is 50 to 100 weekly cases uh, per 100,000 people. Mike, so Mike, basically, Mike, using what uh, the number from Dr. Ellen's slideshow, uh, 262 cases in Westfield in February, that puts our per 100,000 number at almost 800. So we are way off from hitting that 50 per 100,000 target. And I'm and I'm just bringing up the questions that are commonly been asked that I've been monitoring. Uh, another one that's also coming up is just the concern about uh, we've seen it uh, the classes just ending early or not going the full length uh, or days. I mean, I can't validate this in any way. I'm just bringing it up as a comment. That's a big been a concern of parents. Sure. That's and a, sure. That, that that that's a very good point. Actually, I meant to say something about that earlier. If a parent is aware that class is ending early, not one day for a few minutes, but regularly, or something that is scheduled is not happening, um, I, I would really ask them to go directly to that teacher first and say, I'm a little confused. I thought this was the schedule. Why is this not happening? And I'm, I'm sure the teachers are going to respond to that. If for some case, um, some instance, the teachers don't, there is always a chain of command. So you would go to the teacher first and then next either the supervisor or the principal and hopefully it, be, it can be rectified. But yes, if there is a schedule and the students are there and they're ready for their classes, well, then that's what they should have. 
So if there are any concerns, that really is the effective way to address it. You know, just ask the question. You know, um, just ask. I, I'm a little confused. I thought that was supposed to be a 40 minute class and it appeared to be a 20 minute one because there could be a legitimate answer to it. Um, but you're not going to find out if you just talk about it right on social media or, or somewhere like that. Please ask the question and um, and people will respect you and give you an answer to it. Okay, and just a final question, just really, we've touched on high school as far as 5 days a week. And I think the number was referenced about 500. Uh, I don't want to call them children anymore. Uh, <laughs> students, yes. I don't think my daughters would like that. Uh, but 500 students are currently in person at, at this point in time. Do we, we we now have that Wednesday model where we're covering all the uh, Wednesday schedule, I should say, where we're covering all the classes. Do we see that going more toward that schedule for the other four days? Um, so I think some of or that. To a, sorry, I just want to add a tack on because it might change sure. your thinking. Uh, or do we see where maybe, if depending on how many students, could we alternate one week? Cohort A is in full time and cohort B is in uh, full time, where we rotate, and that could also apply to other other uh, elementary or uh, just elementary or intermediate as well. Right. So the high school, um, not just in Westfield, by the way, but across the state. The numbers in the high school, there are more students whose parents are opting for remote. It's just a fact they are. Um, and again, other high schools are finding themselves in the same way. Because of that, there's such a lot of students uh, who are remote. And that's why that day has stayed the same in Wednesday. It's the, it's the one day the teachers can work with the full class, right? Now, that might not stay that way. We really are curious to find out, and that's why we're going to be um, surveying the parents. First, not for a commitment, just for what do you think you're going to do for, for marking period four, just to get a sense of the numbers. How much will that shift? If that shifts a lot, I'm sure part of the conversation will be how do we do Wednesday differently, right? But that will depend on, that's why we need, um, and again, I want to make this clear for any high school parent. When we, uh, when the high school asks um, in a survey, what are you planning for marking period four? At that point, it's not going to be a commitment. It's going to be give us your best guess. Please just be honest with us. Because it's only when you're honest with us and we see the numbers that we can decide what is possible. And again, depending on those numbers, uh, could Wednesdays change? They certainly could. Okay. And that intertwines obviously with the lunch because parents have been asking questions. When the windows are open, will that change the guidelines or you know tents outside or whatever options we can do for lunch that are not necessarily normal, but just provide that option so the students can be in longer. So, okay. Thank you very much for your answers. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And just to clarify, Mike, you used the word monitor uh, today, and I think it came up last week too. And just to clarify the board's position on social media, um, we are all active in our community. We're curious about uh, how people feel about particular issues. Uh, the board does not officially monitor any Facebook feed. We do take a look uh, at comments periodically to see what's out there, but there's no way we can really engage with the public on Board of Ed issues through social media. Um, yeah. Please use email if you would like to engage with the board or Dr. Dolan to find uh, an answer that way. Okay. Yeah, I just let me add one comment on top of that, Amy. Yeah, monitor. We're not necessarily monitoring it. I just out of my own curiosity, and I'm sure there's other board members look at social media to get a, you know, see what what people are talking about. And someone had posted a message about like we should engage the board in conversation on this forum. And really, the forum you should be using is where we are right now. Uh, if you want to look, I think it's policy. And Brendan, correct me if I'm wrong. Zero one six nine. Uh, which is the social media board policy, which essentially prohibits the board from going and engaging on uh, active conversation other than providing informational uh, in, informational uh, posts. Uh, we engage at this meeting, not on social media. That's all. Uh, uh, Mike, you took the words out of my mouth. I was going to say board policy really prohibits us from engaging in uh, anything board related on social media. Uh, occasionally we'll We'll share a public link, but without commentary, and we definitely won't engage in a back and forth or uh, dive into the comments. Yeah, and I, I think that's a, and I was I right on the policy number, Brendan. 
You were you were exactly right. I was actually surprised because <laughs> <laughs> most people don't remember so, by, yeah. by, by heart. And, and, you know, and I, I think just uh, as a board, I think people do want to have that personal conversation and do want to reach out to the community. Um, but it, it's you're kind of like you have to follow the guidelines, and that's what we're trying to do. Uh, given the circumstance, I mean, I'd love to speak to people, parents uh, individually about comments, uh, but just engaging on social media is just because of board policy. And it's not just our policy, it's just from state guidelines and legal advice as well uh, to make sure that we do everything properly. This is the correct form. And the reason we have that policy is because we speak with one voice as a board. Individually, we aren't the board. Uh, so by having the conversation here at the table, it's deliberative. We all get to have our input and we reach a consensus when people are having offline conversations, particularly multiple board members going back and forth about something that deprives the rest of the board of the ability to participate in that conversation and for the public to be aware that the conversation is happening. So, just to stay in compliance with all a whole host of state laws and case law that supports it. Uh, we really try to avoid. Engaging in the banter on social media about about school district business. Okay. Um, all right, I'm not seeing any other hands from other board members. Um, and it looks like all the board members are muting their microphones when they're not speaking, which is good. Getting a little feedback that there's some. Um, a volume issue, perhaps of people watching from home. I don't know if there's anything we can do about that. Brian, I don't know if there's anything you can see. But it sounds like volume levels dropped. People are straining to hear. So. Let's all remember to mute our microphones. Um, and, uh, and now I think we would like to give people an opportunity to make comments as we did last week. Um, I'd just like to re repeat the rules and why we have them. Um, this is the portion of the meeting where you're entitled to make comments. Um, sometimes we've used the word question, but that's a bit of a misnomer. This is the time for you to, um, to make comments for us to take note of them. Um, and if Dr. Dolan feels at the end that she can address any of it, she will. Um, some of it may have to come at a future time. Part of the reason we don't engage in dialogue back and forth at this point of the meeting is that it would deprive people from being able to have their voices heard through public comment. So we are really going to try to keep things moving to the extent that we can. Um, and we just ask you to be mindful of that. It's not because, um, again, we, you know, here we are in our, uh, we're gathered, we're aboard, we could, we could discuss things, but the more we discuss, the less we can hear what your concerns are. So, um, Brian, I'm going to mute my microphone and, um, I'm assuming we might have, uh, anyone who would like to make a public comment now, um, Brian's going to open the, um, the Q and a section. And if you could type in your name and address. When Brian calls your name, uh, he will unmute your microphone to make your comment. Okay. And I just wanted to add anyone that's going to be typing in uh, your name and address that you'd act, well, actually that you'd like to ask a, a question or make a comment. Please only enter it once. Don't keep repeatedly typing it. I will get uh, probably quite a few individuals asking, and that was the problem that we had last week that I kept encountering the same names over and over because people thought that we forgot them. We, we not forgetting you. We just have a running list of all the names. So please just enter your name once. It will it will speed up the process. I appreciate it. So the Q and A box is now open. So if you go to the Q and A box uh, on your screen, and again, just enter your name and address. And as I start to see them appear, I will call on you. You will have three minutes. And again, we will ask you to state your name and your address for the official record. So first, Noel. Heber, uh, Noel, let me just look you up real quick. Okay, I'll unmute you now and you have three minutes. Thank you. You can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Thanks for all you do. I do have one question. Uh, it sounds like based on what Dr. Dolan, you said about the survey that's gonna be coming out about spring break plans, that there might be the potential for going all remote the week after spring break, like we did in the winter time. I was just curious, uh, just to be planful for that. Uh, is that the plan to potentially have to do that? I don't know if you can answer that. Um, that's my question. Thank you. I think I'll just make notes and talk at the end so we can um, listen to everyone. Okay, next we have Vanessa Schwartz. Vanessa, you're unmuted. You can go ahead. You have three minutes. 
Hey, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, my question is, is there a scenario in which 2000 high school students can be in school 5 days, even 5 half days a week by Q4? And if not, what would it take? What, uh, what would be the metrics or what would be the change at the state level to have hybrid end at the high school? Thank you. I'm thinking that's probably going to be one that'll have to get addressed later. So, Brian, why don't we continue with the next comment, please? Okay, next individual is uh, Peter Lyons. Uh, just a moment, Peter, let me pull you up. You are. Okay, Peter, you're unmuted. You have three minutes. Uh, thank you. My son currently goes to Edison in the seventh grade. And he currently complains that the Wi-Fi in the school is lagging, that it's sometimes slower than the he prefers being at school at home, even though he's hybrid because the internet's so slow at school. While I'm ecstatic that the kids are going back five days a week, I'm just concerned that will the Wi-Fi even be slower or are there being any efforts to increase the Wi-Fi, you know, maybe repeaters, whatever's need to be done so they can handle the increase in students at the school. That's it. Thank you. Amy, would you like me to answer that question now briefly? Um, if you can, brief, very briefly. Yes, very briefly. Uh, just so you're aware, uh, thank you, first of all, but what we've been noticing is it's more of the lagging Chromebooks, it's not the Wi-Fi. So if you would please send an email to ithelpdesk at westfieldnjk12.org, I will arrange to have one of my technicians uh, check your, uh, your student's uh, Chromebook. Thank you. Next, we have Connie Corkering. Connie, let me just pull you up. Okay, Connie, you are unmuted and you have three minutes. Hi, just a quick question about the differences between snack and a quote unquote lunch. If we were to maybe perhaps push out this snack and mysteriously rename it lunch and have kids do the same thing they're doing now, Perhaps we could just send some bagels instead of bars and we could have them full day. And in terms of eating outside, I think that we've endured some obviously bad weather over the past few months and we could perhaps do the same going forward. Thanks for your comment. I'm sure it's something that will be taken under advisement. Um, and I think the short answer is there is a lot more into it than just what we call the food that they consume, but it'll definitely be something that gets addressed moving forward. Next, we have Mary Wicken. Uh, Mary, you're unmuted and you have three minutes. Please state your name and address. Hi, it's uh, Mary Wickens, 111 Tudor Oval. Um, uh, thank you all uh, again um, for last week and for this week. Uh, I know you're all in a, a thankless job, um, but uh, I appreciate it. Um, my comment is, um, I know we've gotten all of the advisement and um, surveys for the five half days. My question is, um, would it be possible to know how many kids are going to be in the classes before we make our decision? Um, since we're talking about, you know, safety being first, um, both for, I mean, I have um, elementary and middle, I don't know if high school parents are interested, um, but I'd like to know those two numbers before I make the decision on those um, surveys that you hand out. And um, also, I just want to make the, the comment that uh, I, thank, I thank you for holding off on lunch. Um, hopefully, that won't be brought up until all the teachers can get vaccinated. I mean, there's not even a vaccine for kids yet, so for me, holding off on the lunch um, based on the CDC and eating indoors and that's the most high risk um, is a great decision in my opinion. Thank you very much. Brian, before you go on, can I, can I just make a comment because um, um, participants are starting to respond to each other and ask questions in the chat. 
that is not the purpose of the chat and and information that's provided in those chats is not coming from the district and so i would strongly recommend that those uh, folks refrain from doing that and either only raise their hands or put their name and address in to ask a question or make a comment and just so the board is aware uh, any questions that are asked in the q a box are only visible by the board they are not visible by the rest of the public. So anyone typing any comments, unfortunately, it's only going to the board at this point in time. Next, we have Robert Benaccio. Uh, Robert, you're unmuted and you have three minutes. Uh, sure, Robert Benaccio, 528 Forest Avenue in Westfield. Um, so I'm having a little trouble with, with this meeting. What I'm seeing is a lot of excuses and a lot of self congratulation on, on how things are handled and my main concern is that we are you are not connecting with parents the way you seem to think you are uh, i appreciate that you all have more institutional knowledge than you do or at least you presume you do um, i'm hearing of a superintendent who leads an organization of superintendents on a COVID response but finds the governor's and state guidelines uh, difficult to follow um, and we spent like three to four minutes talking about the board's social media response policy when I don't care. Um, I really just want my kids back. Um, after I spoke at your last meeting, you ceased responding to questions. And, and I think that shows an attitudinal problem here uh, that the board is ready to tell parents what they think they ought to know as opposed to what parents need to know. Uh, and the way these back to school, or at least sort of back to school policies have been rolled out is pretty good evidence of that, right? Last meeting, we're talking about uh, K to two return to school for a few hours, and then we'll see what happens. Well, 600 angry parents later, we've got grades three to five ready to roll and, uh, and a survey for the, um, for the intermediate schools about getting them, them back and rolling. Uh, done in such a rushed fashion that I think you forgot to match the cohorts uh, for in intermediate schools versus elementary schools. So one of two things are happening here, right? Either this was rolled out so quickly that there was no reason for us to wait as long as we did, or uh, you're responding, you had this in your in your pocket all along and just responded to anger. And, and, and neither of those things really, really work. Um, I don't need excuses. This is hard to follow. I need leadership. And when the health officer uh, who has eight districts under her purview, or I should say eight towns under her purview, uh, in at least two of those towns, they've managed to figure out much. And I'm hearing here that the health officer thinks that the next major COVID outbreak is going to be caused by two 10 year olds sitting in the same room eating bologna sandwiches. Uh, I don't know why other school districts are figuring this out and we're not, but we need to start. Um, Robert, you have 30 asked, seconds. I, I knew you were coming. Thank you. Um, sure. I, I had asked last time for the information that's informing your decisions to be posted. I got canned FAQs. I'd like that to happen, please. And I still haven't seen an answer to the question of whether, while our students will be in person, will our teachers be, or will my child be learning from a face on a computer screen? Thank you. Thanks for your comments, Rob. Um, we have tried at the beginning of the meeting to explain that there was a little more to the timeline than just the dates that have unfurled over the last week. Um, just to reiterate that the presentations will be available on the board website and we'll continue to try to respond to messages as they come into us via email. Next, we have Gerald Gleason. Gerald, you will be unmuted now. Please state your name and address. You have three minutes. Yes, uh, Brian, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go right ahead. Hi, Gerald Gleason, uh, 418 uh, Alden Avenue in Westfield. So first of all, uh, maybe just to uh, thank uh, the board, um, uh, also Superintendent Dolan and Ms. Root, uh, just for their comments in, in the beginning of the meeting, kind of, I think, resetting and recalibrating a little bit of the conversation um, from last week, uh, just in terms of where we are and actually how we've gotten to a very different place um, in a week. It seems as though the board, at least the way it's been perceived a little bit from many of the parent stakeholders, that uh, a lot of the uh, timelines and decisions have been um, re-examined and recalibrated in a very short period of time. 
I think um, that while that's appreciative um, of a lot of people, I think it's still a little bit confusing related to the timing of the progress um, and the timelines that we're looking at. I still am very, very confused on why just very specifically it is six weeks away until the middle school will be back full time. Um, it seems to me that we've been able to figure this out already now for some of the some of the younger grades, and we are really extending that period of time um, to make decisions and get people back and get get kids back um, full time. Um, and it's concerning, obviously, because I think you know the learning loss. Um, and the impact to students is very, very real. Um, and it feels to me that even decisions from last week to this week's and the ones that were announced today um, really seem to be moving at a very slow speed, actually, in my opinion, a, a glacial pace in terms of the decision be, decisions that we're making. So I, I would, similar to Mr. Bonacci on the, on the prior uh, comments, I'd really like to understand, you know, again, get more transparency into what data points are being looked at and why it is taking so long to make some of these decisions in the extended timeline um, for which we are operating under. I think the other final comment is, again, while I appreciate a lot of the things in the beginning, it's a little bit disingenuous, actually, I think, to a lot of the parents that there's a lot of uh, compliments and throwing rose petals at people's feet about how hard they're working um, across the board. You have to understand that the parents are working really, really hard as well. We're working, working really hard to try and understand what decisions are being made. We're walk, working very, very hard to homeschool yeah, our seconds. kids in many cases. Um, understood. Thank you. Um, and, and just so I think everyone knows you're working hard, but we're working hard, too. And I think the final comment would be I, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the scope of the survey related to spring break. Many parents, many that I know, have been very adherent to the guidelines that you that set out from a medical perspective. And I'm trying to understand what we're going to be surveyed if we've been adhering to those guidelines all along to understand what the impact to schools would be. Thank you for your uh, listening. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is that microphone muted, Brian? Let me check. Brian? Please. Yeah, yeah, I'm checking. There's some background noise coming uh, Peter through. Peter Lyons is unmuted. Yes, yeah, he's now muted. Okay. All right. Um, okay, thank next. you. No, we we hear your comments. I'm sure there will be um, there will be some answers um, forthcoming from the survey. I think um, I'm glad that you've been following the rules, and um, that's certainly what we ask of our parents to do. But we also know that there's some COVID fatigue out there, and some people. Knowing that there's a week um, of of time away, maybe um, looking at visiting family or something like that. So that's what the survey is intended to uh, to to inquire about. So thank you. Let's move on to the next comment, please, Brian. Amy, if I may, real fit, may, real fast, is just to reiterate what Dr. Dolan had stressed earlier. The the travel and quarantine guidelines are on our webpage. It's on the state website. Uh, so the survey isn't supposed to supplement or or take the place of what those rules and regs are. So just be sure to to look those up, and and they and they they have changed over time. So it's important that that parents keep on top of those. Next is Kyle George. Kyle, you're okay. unmuted. You have three minutes. Thank you, um, Kyle George, six hundred five Short Hills Court. Uh, I've heard a restart committee mentioned repeatedly. Um, I can find very little about this. Uh, where are the live streams, minutes, and other documents that such a committee would be producing? Uh, I searched on the website and I see very little there. Uh, this committee has been cited as meeting uh, since last year. Uh, where, are the, where are the records? Where are the materials? Uh, I'd like the, uh, the, the superintendent and the board to provide that. Um, COVID guidelines were cited during today's meeting for not having uh, lunch at school and thus not having full-time school this year. Uh, Dr. Dolan's notes after the last meeting indicated that there is intent to have kids back full-time in the fall. Uh, what conditions are you expecting to change between now and the fall? And what are the contingency plans if conditions change? Um, 
And speaking of uh, of guidelines, uh, which guidelines specifically and from whom specifically are you waiting to get clearance uh, at whatever stage to reopen? Uh, you know, now or full time. I've heard health department. I've heard CDC. I've heard state. I've heard various school board industry organizations that are not legislative. Um, you know, they're just uh, like professional organizations. So can you please give specific citations on the website uh, as you know, as to as to what the current. Um, you know, guidelines that you're yeah, that are either recommendations or our law. That you are uh, trying to follow. Um, earlier in the meeting, Mr. Galligan, to paraphrase, said that there that the board doesn't disagree with each other in public. Um, I want to know what is the utility and service of the public good of having a public united front all the time? How is the public supposed to know the topics of deliberation? I understand the need to have closed door sessions when personnel are involved, but for reopening discussions, there's nothing protected. And I don't see the board ever disagreeing with each other in public. I mean, imagine if our uh, you know, uh, uh, state and federal legislatures held all their uh, debates uh, behind closed doors. You can imagine the public would not have a good uh, idea of what was going on. Uh, I'd like to recommend that the board um, publicly debate with each other, so that so that the the public uh, can thirty seconds can see some of those discussions uh, out in the open. Thank you. Amy, I'm going to respond to that real quick. Uh, the, my comment, uh, which was paraphrased, uh, was taken out of the context of our social media policy, and how we we won't the, we won't debate school board matters in uh, Facebook groups or in comment threads, so that we can have the conversation and the debate in public. I never suggested that we don't debate things in public uh, as a board. We just can't do it through Facebook. Amy, can I make a comment, please? Uh, okay, quickly, yeah. since yeah. we need to get on with hearing the public. Yep. Yeah. No, I just I appreciate everybody's comments about the board and and critiques, uh, but I just want to say one thing is is first, the we're thrilled that you're participating. We're thrilled that we have over three hundred and twenty people uh, at the meeting. This is exactly how you engage. Uh, I ask that it be constructive. I ask that it not be ad hominem attacks. I ask that it not be um, for the purpose of trying to be divisive as a per as opposed to trying to search for the truth. I think that um, I can certainly speak for myself is that you know the more we get resources and reports and information, we read them. And Dr. Dolan reads them. She, she reads more than we do because this is her full time professional job and she's the expert. So I, I think it's just important. I want to just put a little. To, to respond to say, uh, be constructive and and give us information that helps us make uh, reasoned decisions. And you're not going to agree with every decision, uh, and that's okay. But we are trying our best to give you the information and the basis for which we make those decisions. And I and I have to say that uh, Dr. Dolan is is you know, doing her best uh, to to respond and. This is an evolving. This is an evolving situation, and it's difficult for all of us, and, and all of many of us are parents as well. So we're not we're not oblivious to what's going on. But I just ask that those people who are making the comments treat us like a member of your team. Right, we're working together. Attacks is it's not constructive, and it's a waste of time. So so let's look for solutions. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for the end of it. Brian, do we have a next comment, please? Yes, the next comment is from Megan Brennan. Megan, uh, you're unmuted and you have three minutes. Please give your name and address. Hi, um, Megan Brennan, 862 Rahway Avenue. Um, first, I just wanted to say thank you to Dr. Dolan and the board um, for exercising caution in everything that you're doing right now. My family is being very cautious um, and so I appreciate what you're trying to do and that you're trying to do it gradually. I just had one um, comment. There's a lot of talk about, you know, outdoor classes and outdoor lunch and um, let's do all this outdoor stuff. I just would like to make sure that people are remembering that we also have security issues that we need to keep um, 
keep in our minds and to make sure that um, we're not doing something that is is going to put anybody in danger um, in in a different way by by moving outdoors. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks for your comment. We appreciate it. Okay, Brian, next one. Next is Alex Liggett. Alex, you have three minutes. Go right ahead. Hi, thank you for taking my call. Alex Liggett, 800 Kimball Avenue um, here in Westfield. So first I would also just extend thanks to everybody for participating, parents and the board and the superintendent. Um, I also would like to recognize our children, which nobody has done yet, not the board, not the superintendent. And I haven't heard any parents, but our children really are the people that have stepped up this year to learn in an environment and on platforms that's never been done before. So I'm super proud of them for hanging in there. But I do um, would like to pose a question to the board about the possibility of outside activities. And I do recognize the previous caller's concern about safety, but you know, in this environment, we do have to weigh risks and benefits. And there's going to be, a, there's no zero risk environment here. And if there are obstacles to outside lunch that might get our children into school full day, such as need for proctoring, equipment, et cetera, please be super transparent with the parents. We are all willing to step up to fundraise, to have rosters of volunteers as needed on the playgrounds, to uh, proctor the children during lunch, or any other outside activity that we can help with because we all are super motivated to get our kids back in school. Thank you. Thanks, I just wanted to add real quick. Um, that's why Dr. Dolan in one of her slides said, reaching out to your PTOs and to your principals is a great place to start, but definitely really good points. Um, and we thank you for your comments. Stephanie Conway, you're now unmuted. You have three minutes. Please state your name and address. Hi, Stephanie. It's actually Gillespie, 936 Harding Street. Um, so I think what we want to do here, and I agree and you agree, is we should follow the science. I, I, I sometimes feel, though, that, you know, look, this is the first pandemic. I see everybody scrambling and following, you know, we're, I've heard it said three times, we're reading the reports as soon as they come out. We're looking at the guidance, we're following the guidance. This guidance and these reports are, if anything, anyone's best guess. I would ask you, and I, I'm actually, I, I want a response, like, would you consider using the science, the science of the power of observation and, and potentially reaching out to maybe five principles within our school district and seeing how it's gone and how they've done lunch. I can tell you from experience, my daughter's been all year in Westfield daycare center. She eats lunch there and three snacks a day, every day. And we've had no issues. The school closed down one time in the entire year because a teacher had brought COVID into the school and it was nothing. It was nothing. I think few people got the sniffles. It was a non-issue. So that's the first part of my question. I don't mind, my, my second part, I think people disagree with me. And my question is, is it on the table to send the kids home for lunch and have them come back? Dr. Dolan, is it? So I, I think I mentioned before, I'm just trying to take notes. My question is, can I, we put it on the table? I understand the question. I said I was gonna take notes and talk at the end so we can listen to people. Thank you. Brian, who's next? Next is Lisa Hamlish. Lisa, you're unmuted. You have three minutes. Thank you. And uh, hopefully you can hear me okay. Lisa Hamlish, 676 Dorian Road in Westfield. Thank you for listening to my question. I have I have two parts. One is about kindergarten. I'm very happy they are going back to school five half days. Thank you for all the work and research. My one question is, um, will you look at or have you looked at 
having the full half day kindergarten experience. Right now, the kindergartners are only learning for an hour and a half approximately, and it really feels like they're um, they could be there longer, um, especially as we go back five half days and we were set up for AM and PM. Um, I understand RAP, the RAP is an important supplementary program. Just thinking about we have a few months left in school and wouldn't it be great to get them in a little bit longer um, for the actual school day versus RAP. And my second question or point is just about the spring break survey. Totally understand it. Um, just curious if there is. I don't know if the, the survey was meant to say, if enough people are planning to go away, we're just going to have school be remote for a week or two after. Um, but wouldn't it be better if we just left it up to the parents to be honest? And if they did travel to have their children be remote, but for the people that did not travel, maybe allow them and their kids to go back to school. We Again, we only have a few more months left of school and would love to get the kids in the classroom as much as possible. Thank you. That's, thank you for your comment. I know Dr. Dolan alluded earlier in her presentation to the fact that because there's so much changing um, with the kindergarten children, um, extending the amount of time they're in school is definitely something that's a that's a goal. Um, uh, so it it is something that is being um, being addressed and I'm um, being looked at, and there'll be more forthcoming on that. Next is Janice Agresti. Janice, I'll unmute you now. You have three minutes. Please state your name and address. Uh, actually, the person who just spoke before me asked the question I wanted to ask. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next is Eric Costa. Eric, just give me a second here. I'll unmute you. All right, you're unmuted and you have three minutes, Eric. Hello, uh, Eric Costa, 1211 Sedgwick Avenue. Firstly, I want to just congratulate and say thank you to our teachers, principal, and school staff who have done and continue to do a fantastic job under the circumstances. I also want to thank all the parents in the district, all of whom have also been working hard to make sure all our kids get the best education possible. I wrote a letter to the editor of Tap into Westfield regarding the situation in our school district, which was published uh, yesterday. I stand by every word of that, and it's available on Tap, so I won't repeat it. But save for the overarching theme of avoiding leadership and vision originating with the superintendent and board president. Once again tonight, our superintendent spent time congratulating herself for the district being open since September, albeit for only two days a week, and keeps looking to compare us to districts that weren't open at all. For us parents, we strive to be like the districts that are open, not look down on those that are less open than we are. The fact is, many districts, if not most equivalent suburban districts in this country, have been open and remain open. Tonight, she then dismissed the concerns of parents about the lack of information by showing us a slide on how many emails she sent out. She's talking about community cases as a reason for not previously opening while ignoring the fact, the absolute fact, that there is almost no documented transition in schools here or anywhere. If we're going to follow the science, let's do that and follow the science. While the school board president may be expecting a pat on the back for finally deciding to expand in-person instruction to five days a week, at least for K through five, I think what we really need is a gentle push out the door. Whatever good they may have done for this school district pre-COVID, at this point, it's fair to say their handling of COVID has been an abject disaster. The time to make a leadership change is now, when we still have four full months of school left, before an entire school year's worth of proper or even adequate education is squandered. Looking at my kids' education has become like watching a disaster unfold in slow motion. It's great that we are expanding the number of in-person half days and weeks from now at that. But that is far from the only issue. We need full day in person education and we need to get rid of the Chromebooks for students who opt to attend in person. With respect to full day in person instruction, if the only obstacle, or at least the biggest obstacle, is lunch, if Dr. Dolan and Miss Root can't figure out a way to let the kids eat, and that's why we can't have full days, then right now, right this moment, they should stand up and walk out and let their interim successors take over. Just last week, the United States landed a vehicle on Mars in an unprecedented feat of engineering. Are we really to believe lunch is too hard to figure out? The issue seconds. seems to be a misunderstanding of what CDC guidelines mean. They are just that, 
guidance. The CDC guidance, as recently stated by Vice President Harris, is not a legally binding directive. It's their advice for the best practices in a perfect world. But this isn't a perfect world. And the best we can do is get as close as we can to compliance with their guidance and accept that whatever risk that we entail with less than total compliance, it's far outweighed by the benefits of getting our kids a proper education. As for the Chromebooks, I can only assume that last summer, Dr. Dolan thought she had come up with a brilliant solution Time is to the up. COVID problem. Thanks for sharing your thoughts. Who's next, Brian? Next will be Maria Constantino. Maria, just give me a moment while I pull you up. <laughs> Maria, you're unmuted. You have, I'm sorry, hold on. Yes, Maria, you're unmuted. You have uh, three minutes. Thank you. Um, it's Maria Constantino, nine Karen Terrace. Um, I, I wanted to express um, similar concerns as some of the, the other folks about transparency. You know, I feel I've been following this very closely and I still am not clear on why we're following only the CDC guidance. I understand some of these decisions, you know, were made at the state level, but um, just today in the Wall Street Journal, there was an article that quoted um, an American Academy of Pediatrics um, representative who, you know, said again that the CDC guidelines are guidelines and that they are in a perfect world and that six feet, for example, is, you know, when you don't have other things that mitigate the risk, such as masks, which of course we would have. So I feel like we're still not clear as parents on what we are striving for. Are we striving for a certain level of community spread where community spread doesn't have anything to do with the particular schools? Is the community the town or is the community the county? When we say we're going to have a survey for the high school parents, what does that mean? What are the interdependencies? What are the requirements? What will it take to allow 2,000 students to go back to school? We have no idea. If you're saying there's going to be a survey and there's a chance that we're going to go backwards and go to two mornings again, that's just unacceptable. I mean, we, we have no idea what our benchmarks are and what the requirements for getting back to school are. We hear lunch is a concern, but what else is a concern? And, and I absolutely echo the sentiments that we have to be a lot more creative. And I don't know why snack doesn't equal lunch. Um, you know, we, we can limit it to 15 minutes or figure out some way to do it, but we need to know what we're striving for. We need to know what these magic parameters are that are going to get our kids back to school. Well, I was thrilled to see the FAQ that we expect to be back fully in September. I was thrilled to hear the governor say he expects to be back in September. We need specifics. We expect, we hope, we, this is our thought. It's really seconds. not enough. As parents, we have to plan. I can't tell you how many people have their names on private school lists because they have no idea if their children are going to get an adequate education. So September is a must have, and we have to be a lot better and a lot quicker about getting them into a full day school, you know, in, in the near term here before the end of the year. And with regard to spring break, I think we're all adults. Next weekend, my daughter's going out of town and she's going Time to is home up. for a week after that. We're all adults and we're all trying to do the right thing. Got it. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Brian. Next is Claudia Palladino. Claudia, I'll unmute you now. You have three minutes. Please uh, give your name and address. Hi, this is Claudia Palladino from 216 Kimball. Um, there's been a lot of focus on the grade schools and plans for the middle schools, but I'm really interested in understanding for the high school. 
the AB cohort structure is why the kids aren't going back. The kids who are in school have to sit and wear headphones and they're watching the class from the school. So it really doesn't make sense to be there. They're virtual anyway, even when they're in school. It's an alternative to the cohort system before the year ends. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Robert Hickey. Robert, give me a moment and I'll unmute you. Okay, Robert, you're unmuted. You have three minutes. Please state your name and address. Good evening, Rob Hickey, 725 Dorian Road. Uh, I'm just surprised we've gotten this long into the presentation and no one discussed President Biden's announcement today that he's going to prioritize educators so that every educator could have the vaccine by the end of March. And it's kind of been a frustration of mine with, I would say, the board and Dr. Dolan is a lack of creativity and being proactive. How was that not the first thing discussed tonight? That's a huge game changer. Um, obviously, if we can vaccinate the teachers in March, by the time we get to spring break with the effectiveness of these vaccines, that's going to increase the safety level significantly. Second point of that is with the kids. I mean, you know, school age children, Dr. Dolan pointed out that in January, the cases in Westfield skyrocketed and 24% were school age kids. But thankfully, school age children in New Jersey, zero fatalities, 0.03% have ever been hospitalized. So the kids impact and the severity of COVID on children is much different than adults. So now if we have the opportunity for our teachers to get vaccinated this month, and we've already shown statistically that it's not a large impact on our children, why aren't we getting them back to school sooner? Why aren't we doing things more robustly? And the thing that I would point out is what is more severe for the kids? Is it COVID or is it the mental aspect, their mental health of not being in school, not being with their friends, not getting the education that they deserve and require. That's the biggest factor that's going to come out of COVID is the mental harm that our children have suffered from not having this school experience. And I really hope that you guys would sit there and say, okay, this is new information on the ground. The teachers are going to have the opportunity to get vaccinated. What do we do to take advantage of that? Thank you. Thanks for your comments. I would say um, just real quickly, the fact that Governor Murphy said teachers are eligible in mid-March to start getting vaccinated is an even better sign, which we have addressed during the meeting. Um, and it's good that communicability among kids is lower, but kids aren't in classrooms by themselves. There are teachers there with them too, or not children. Thanks, Brian. Who's next? Lindsay Monahan. Lindsay, you're unmuted. You have three minutes. Please state your name and address. Hi, Lindsay Monahan for Hawthorne Drive. I'd like to get back and reiterate some of the thoughts that were spoken about before with regard to lunch and outdoor time. Um, I know that there seems to be much debate about a snack versus a sandwich. I just want to reemphasize that our kids' days, their schedules, their learning, their life has been so contorted and so messed up, and that's just in the sense of school, that having a shorter snack or two shorter snacks and not the normal gap time or socializing would be minimal if that was included in a more full day, more normal schedule, as opposed to a full sit down, chat, run around recess. I think that parents and children alike would be thankful for the full day for something that felt more like a normal day. If we could capture a normal schedule for them and give up some of the small snack ideas and then going you know, I think somebody brought up uh, the outdoor issue that that would have some sort of a safety issue. In life, we take risks. The children have had recess, they've had gym, they've had various close to school field trips. 
everything bears some sort of a risk. I think that existed before coronavirus. I don't think that because they are sitting outside having a snack that there's any sort of, you know, greater um, threat to them. But I want to just confirm that most parents out there do feel that extending the day, chopping up snack in whatever way they have to, is something. It is a incredibly, incredibly small thing that they'll give up. Thank you. Thanks for sharing your thoughts. Brian, who's next? Next is Rachel Perlman. Rachel, give me a moment to find you. Okay, Rachel, you're unmuted and you have three minutes. Please state your name and address. <clears throat> Hi, Rachel Perlman, 520 Clifton Street. I just want to bring up, um, you know, mental health again, more about going remote after spring break. Just to get an idea, I just got done putting my seven-year-old to bed, holding him hysterically crying because he's scared that he won't get to the third grade. They need to be in school more. That's, that's what they, they need to be in school, however you do it. But I'm worried about five days, but let's first just make sure that we are there the week after spring break. Let's give us the choice, please. It's not fair. It's not fair if you're going to allow people to choose to go away. I'm choosing to stay home and follow the rules and have my kids in school where they need to be. I hope you take that into consideration. Thank you. Brian, who's next? Uh, John Lamparello. John, you're unmuted and you have three minutes. Hey, everybody. Um, I just wanted to take a minute and ask, uh, see, maybe this is a little different or there's, uh, it's been communicated in other ways that I just haven't been able to find. But, you know, ultimately our, as parents, our conduit or our, you know, connection to all this is through the board, right? You guys were all elected. Uh, some of you probably say, why did I ever do this? <laughs> some of you are probably saying, oh, this is great. And, you know, I have a future in, uh, in political office somewhere one day, right? But I'd ask maybe if there's an opportunity for the board members to share their opinions on this through some other venues, right? Whether it's uh, the leader tap into, maybe even during this meeting, just what you specifically think about the re the school reopening plan, where we are, if this meets benchmarks that you think are acceptable to us, or if you think there's other things that we should be doing that could change. I think, you know, that's one thing, you know, I haven't been able to find anywhere is just each board member's personal feeling on this, right? So I think, you know, I'd ask if you go and, you know, write a letter to, to any of those, uh, publications and say what you honestly feel right and maybe a little deeper than something like we're going to open as soon as we can as safely as we can right but you know specific hurdles that you find specific things you think have to change before we open i think would be uh would be a really good one and i i, I say this not in the sense of maybe creating division between you guys on the board of uh you know in, in showing your different opinions but ultimately taking ownership of this issue, right? At the end of the day, it's the Board of Ed who's elected and who has uh, a lot of say here, right? And when we have these situations of people pointing at the CDC, pointing at Dr. Dolan, pointing at the health department, everybody's pointing in a circle. At the end of the day, it's the Board of Education that has the power here, right? Uh, to an extent. So again, I'd encourage you just to, uh, to let all of your opinions be known through uh, whatever public venue uh, or forum you can. Thank you. Amy, may I request that you just correct the, the information that was just shared? Um, yeah, we, we had a discussion. Um, yeah, um, the board speaks with 1 voice because that's how we're organized and that is. Um, and, and, and that is how it's intended to be uh, individual board members may have. Personal thoughts on things, um, but it doesn't carry weight um, unless we are all together as one board in a meeting such as now. Um, I think it's very unlikely and not helpful um, to do what you're suggesting, 
but um, but we can hear you out and uh, and um, and we thank you for sharing your thoughts. I was I actually else wants to say anything on that. I was referring to the comment of the board having the ultimate power here on reopening the schools. That specific comment needs to be corrected. Mm -hmm. uh, we we all you know many of us on the board have children of all ages and completely empathize and totally understand how every angry parent is feeling. But, you know, we don't have that power, so it needs to be clarified. Thank you. Yeah, uh, specifically, uh, Governor Murphy in his executive orders that <coughs> directed schools to create a reopening plan back in over the summer and the numerous updates to those executive orders since uh, put uh, the ultimate authority in with the superintendent. Uh, but we do collaborate on those plans and by a, the time a plan is public, there is a consensus among the board. Uh, supporting that plan, at least with the condition with the understanding the conditions and circumstances that are particular to Westfield. Yeah, um, just to, to, yeah, Gretchen. Oh, sorry. Well, can we so, let Gretchen speak? She had her hand up earlier. Yeah. So, I, I, I mean, I think I was just going to add sort of the tag on to what Tara was saying is that we, we don't have the power, nor do we have the expertise. That's not what this board is. We are a policy making board and we, uh, it is our responsibility to set policy and then we hire people to implement the policy. And so, you know, 1 of the things that has frustrated me and, and maybe I shouldn't be talking, but I'm going to talk is that, you know, I've been on this board for 10 years. And I've had the amazing opportunity to work with Dr. Dolan and her staff. And there is no one, there's no parent, there's no principal, there's no one other than Dr. Dolan and the people on her central staff who understand this from a bird's eye perspective. So you can be a teacher, a parent, a student, the principal of Franklin and have absolutely no idea what's gonna work at Jefferson. That's just a reality. And so I just don't, I, I'm frustrated because, you know, we keep hearing about transparency and it feels a little bit like transparency has become, we're being not transparent if we're not telling you what you wanna hear. Um, and there's a lot of finger wagging and there's a lot of, you know, nobody's, nobody by sort of acknowledging the work that the district has done or that the board has done, nobody was minimizing the role of parents that far from it. I mean, without a doubt, every single student, every single parent, every single teacher, and every single administrator in this district has been busting their hump in a completely new circumstance pandemic. And you can't talk about how amazing our teachers are and simultaneously say that this district isn't well run because the teachers aren't amazing in isolation. They're only able to do what they do because they have the support of the administration. So I, you could probably tell I'm frustrated. Um, and, and so that, you know, it, it, I'm not, I, I'm grateful for the comments. I'm, I'm grateful that people are offering opinions and suggestions and support. I just, you know, I, I wish that if you re you really wanted to know, you, if you were really invested in the transparency because you're the taxpayers and our property taxes are the one that support the district, then when we had probably the most transparent thing we can do, which is we go through the budget like we did last Tuesday, that eight out of nine people didn't flee the meeting. It's like you want to know how your money's spent, but you're not going to stick around to hear it. So that's my level of frustration. My opinion as a 10 year board member is I fully completely support the thoughtful and deliberate way that the district is trying to get our kids back in school. Thank you. Thank you, Gretchen, for sharing your thoughts. Um, Layla, I had cut you off. Did you have something you wanted to say before we move on? Uh, yes, I did. Um, it doesn't really follow what Gretchen had said, um, but I, I wanted to say to John, and now I now your last name escapes me. Um, I appreciate that you want to hear from board members and hear the opinions um, and the perspectives. Uh, but what I was going to say is that this is public session, and while you may want to hear what what we have to say, you're not seeing all the comments on the side telling us this is public session. Please don't speak. We don't want to hear from the board. So I really do hear it um, as a parent of three, 
as an educator in the school system, I do hear that you want to hear what the board's thinking, but not everybody does. So I just, want, I just wanted to say that to you. All right. That sounds like a good segue to get back to um, get back to public comment. I thank you, everyone, for um, for helping to clarify. But you're right; we should be hearing from the public. So, Brian, who's next? Next is Julie Steinberg. Julie, you're unmuted, and you have three minutes. Hi, Julie Steinberg, 109 Belmar Terrace. Um, I wanted to make a couple of points. Um, first. Um, I do see the mental health issues um, presenting themselves both in and out of the schools. Um, and I just wanted to raise that one program that I think that has been pre COVID and now during COVID underutilized is the ESS program, both in special services and maybe even outside of special services. I was wondering whether or not you're anticipating an uptick in IEPs for special services um, afterwards, uh, uh, you know, as a result of this pandemic. And I was hoping that perhaps there could be some consideration of expanding ESS since it's only offered at the high school in Roosevelt, and perhaps it should be offered also at Edison and maybe even at the elementary levels to help address some of these issues, um, which are significant and I think we can all agree district wide. Um, the second thing I wanted to suggest is that perhaps some parent education might be in order um, because there's clearly a need for communication that perhaps isn't always best um, suited in a Board of Education meeting forum because as Gretchen rightly pointed out, there's also a lot of other business that is very, very important and sometimes these things get pent up and, and heated. And finally, I just wanted to say that as a parent, um, I myself and my children have been going through a lot during this period. It's been very difficult. My children have suffered as has everybody's and I am understanding why people are weary and angry. I have had my own issues with the district. Um, I have disagreed with a lot of people on this board and a lot of people in the administration um, and in the schools. And I know I'm not everybody's favorite person and so on and so forth. But I have to say that it has really been hard for me both in the previous meeting and in this meeting, watching the vitriol and um, frankly abuse that has been heaped on Dr. Dolan, the board and the administration. I do believe that actually a great deal of creativity and thoughtfulness has been provided an, an enormous amount of hard work. And I believe that everybody is tired and frustrated, but I don't always know whether or not everybody understands how much work and creativity has been coming. And I seconds. don't always know if everybody appreciates it, but it really breaks my heart to see it. And it breaks my heart to see Dr. Dolan retiring. And um, I know it's gonna be very difficult for us to find someone to replace her. So I just want the board to know and Dr. Dolan and her team to know that even though I don't always agree with everything that you're doing, that I see and I think many others see the good work that you are doing. And I hope that once we come out of this, we can all go back to a more civil series of conversations. That's it. Thank you, Julie. Um, Layla, if I could just add your mic is still on. Um, oh, thank you. There you go. Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you um, again, Julie. Brian, who's next? Next, we have Monica Bergen. Monica, let me pull you up and I'll unmute you now. Again, you have three minutes. Uh, state your name and address. Hi, uh, Monica Bergen, 609 St. Mark's Avenue. Um, I just have to say bravo to Gretchen for um, speaking what anybody that's ever been involved in the district as long as I have, unfortunately, I mean, not unfortunately at all, but I am going to miss Dr. Dolan so much. And I thank you for everything that you've done for the kids. And you and I have not always agreed on things, but I, you are the most thoughtful person and every scenario is thrown to you and you give it everything to make sure that the kids interest is, is the best. And I'm, I'm frustrated because I, I'm so happy that all these parents, that 900 parents, maybe it's duplicate from the other night, but 
if 600 the other night and 300 are on tonight are getting involved, I urge you to be involved more in the district because this is really important, but it's a pandemic and none of us have ever been through anything like this. And Dr. Dolan is, and her staff is really trying to give every consideration possible and I'm sorry that you're being so disrespectful to her. The other night was, I, I know I'm not judging jury on anything, but it was embarrassing that the things that you threw at her and I hope that you are going to really give some thoughtful consideration to everything and know that she has your kids best interest at heart and i thank you for everything i thank you you know julie you also said that um there were things and i'm rambling and so i'm just going to say thank you very much for everything and i will miss you dr dawn but i'm glad we're walking out together thank you monica um if i could just remind people um keep Try to address your your comments to the to the board. I can't believe I'm saying that, but um, it is something that that's important. It's hard not to acknowledge people you know, of course, who've spoken. But um, ad address the board and address me if you have to. Thank you. Next is Greg Casco. Greg, you have uh, three minutes. You're unmuted. State your name and address, please. Good evening, Greg Casco, 434 Everson Place. Um, I somewhat want to echo. Uh, Monica Bergen's comments regarding the support of education. I've been listening to the meetings and I've, I've remained silent until tonight. And those that know those that do know me know that I, I tend to be vocal on, on local issues. Having lived in town for over 48 years, but everything's on the website. The state guidelines are the guidelines. And the health department has made it very clear that the districts had to follow those guidelines. Uh, Dr. Dolan has explained the requirements that are posted on the website, masks six feet apart, and has asked that we all advocate at the state level. And instead of doing our research and listening, many of the speakers last time and tonight choose to ignore the statements and do nothing more than lob verbal disrespectful attacks on the Board of Education. And I find that to be an embarrassment to our community. And I hope that those that did speak condescendingly tonight and previously do reflect on, on some of the ignorance that they've shown this board tonight. These are volunteers. I do understand that they're elected. They put their name in the hat to serve, but that doesn't give us a right as a community uh, to attack them, especially when it's been made clear that Dr. Dolan is following guidelines set forth by the state of New Jersey. Um, thank you all for your volunteerism, and you all have a good night. Thank you, Greg. Brian, who's next? Uh, we don't have anyone else this time. Well, that works for me. Okay. And and I think, if, uh, if I may, before we transition over to the rest of the board, um, I just wanted to also make some clarification uh, because I was reached out to by a couple of PTOs, especially the Wilson PTO. To be clear, the PTOs do not have a part or nor are they um, decision makers on what this school district does. They are a volunteer organization. They look to do what best, um, what 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 can best impact their their respective schools, and they um, do us a service by oftentimes taking comments and relaying them to this board. Uh, I was on the Wilson PTO as I as I talked about last meeting uh, for almost two and a half hours, give or take, to listen to parents. Uh, but to be clear, they they are not a part of the decision making process. 
but they are extremely helpful and beneficial to this district. And, and, and I thank them so much for what they do day in and day out. And, and I want to echo some of the comments that Greg and others made um, uh, today is, you know, they too have been attacked by some people. They too have received some criticism and, and, and other comments made. And I, and I think that too is so very unfair for, for parents that uh, I've been through my daughter, she's in fifth grade. I've been on, I've been part of almost every single PTO meeting since she's been in, in grammar school. And uh, it's usually just the board that attend those PTO meetings, but they attend them faithfully and dutifully uh, every single time. And that's just the board meetings, forget about what they do during the time. So I just wanna make sure the role of the PTOs, the importance of the PTOs and what they do. Uh, and, and, I, and I also thank them for their, for their time and efforts. Yeah, that is an excellent point. And I have also been reached out to by the school that I liaise with um, to reemphasize that point that we we mention them um, as as an entry point for um, for parents to get involved with helping the schools with knowing what might be useful for fundraising or for providing of resources at a particular school. That's the context in which we suggest that people reach out to those PTOs, not because um, they they participate in the uh, decision making process. I agree absolutely. Um, and then um, one uh, question also that had come up is Dr. Dolan's presentation that, um, that we saw with the slides. Um, people are already wondering where where we they can find it on the website um, after the meeting is over. And I am hazarding a guess, but I'm happy to be corrected that um, it will there will probably be a portion under the the COVID. Uh, the COVID floater um, that'll be on the board on the um, district website. Um, and it, of course, will be a, a portion of this meeting as well. Um, okay. That's true. Uh, so Great. Br briefly, I certainly won't try to address everything at all. I uh, just want to stress um, a few parents mentioned about the high school. There is no doubt um, determining how to um, how to have 2000 students in the building is is beyond a challenge. There's no doubt about that, right? But we still we want to hear from parents what are their plans for the fourth market period so that we can do the best job we can. But no no doubt about that. Middle school is is completely different than the elementary school, right? For obvious reasons, they have different schedules, they're with different teachers. So that's the reason why we need additional time. Um, and honestly, the spring break survey is just that. I mean, the the um, the medical officials in the state um, and in the um, country are saying you really should only do essential travel. Okay. Um, that's not exactly what we're hearing. And if a lot of people are going to be traveling, that's fine. That's, you know, that's fine. But we need to make sure that uh, when our students come back, they're going to be safe. So all it is, it's a survey to try to get a sense of that so that we can make an informed decision. It's nothing beyond that. I understand the parent who's saying she has been careful and she will, she's going to continue to be careful. I applaud that. Uh, and we all need to be careful and follow the rules. The new travel advisory guidelines are different. I've had to read them four times to understand them, to be perfectly honest. So please check them and make sure that if you are traveling, you are following them. Um, and with that, honestly, we continue to work at every level and we continue to follow the guidelines from the CDC and from the New Jersey Department of Health because we are required to do that. But we continue to do that. Dr. Dolan, can I make a request on that? Can we send out those guidelines if they're if they're that confusing that that you did need to read them more than once? Maybe we can try to get some clarity and send out once we have that clarification what those guidelines are. Sure. Because if it's, I know it might be posted on the website, but if we can actually send it out in an email before spring break, I think that will be helpful for the parents. Sure. Thank you. Just one other comment. We often hear the comment about metrics and uh, what's the, the decision making process. I don't know if it's possible to either have Megan Avalon come to the meeting to show the metrics that we can compare it against, or if there's metrics that can be presented to the parents so they see somewhat how the decision making process is being made for the various issues on how many children we need to have in school, uh, what we do, what we're doing for lunch and why we're, why we have to limit lunch at this point in time or or what the future trends predict on when we can do lunch. Obviously, we don't we can't predict the future, but it, we often hear these comments and I I mean just to go on the comments, we often hear CDC, Department of Health, New Jersey and it's not clear, I think, to a lot of people. I mean, speaking as a parent, 
just I, I I hear all the comments that everyone's saying. I have two daughters who are seniors in high school. Some people have McKinley, but I have that perspective. And the students, you know, and I, I feel for the parents because I'm going through the same thing as a parent where I see my daughters in a bedroom during senior year when it's their final year in high school. I see them wanting to go and uh, be with their friends. I see them uh, impacted by the open school windows. I, I, I see them applying to college and we can't go to college. It's not normal situations. But the one thing I have to say, it's just a very complex situation. This isn't a situation where we can just pinpoint and say, oh, there's the number 57 or whatever the number is and go and say, make a decision and open the doors. I wish we could. I wish my kids can be back in school eating lunch and, we, and having that full day. And, you know, I'm not saying every every board member aligns and everything. I think there's definitely disagreements. And but, but we come together for what's the best for all the students and no one's going to agree on everything. But I, I think Dr. Dolan and the team is trying their best under these very difficult circumstances. And, you know, do I agree? And I do. I wish we, we would do things differently in some ways. I do, but I, I ha we have to follow what, as uh, someone said, Dr. Dolan is a bird's eye view of the whole district and we have a piece of it. I have a, a better view of what it is in high school than I do what's in McKinley, but she has the view across the board. And I think we have to give some, I don't wanna say time because we've had a lot of time, but the benefit of the doubt that she's making the decisions and working as quickly as possible to get our kids back in school. And I hope my kids are back in school for the fourth quarter and our graduation is normal. I don't know if we can do prom, but you know, it's, every student in this district is missing out in some way. And I, I think that to say that the board members with the parents, the parents that, uh, that the parents that are board members, they're all experiencing this. And um, I, I just hope you can understand. It's not, we don't hear you. We do hear you. And I wish we could do more. And uh, that's all. All right. Very well said. Okay. There's no uh, no complaints. Otherwise, I think I will move along uh, to the next part of our meeting, which is uh, I would like the board to approve the minutes of the board meeting held on February 23rd, 2021, and the private minutes of February 20, 23rd, 2021. Wow, it's a lot of 20s. Can I have a second? Second. second. Brendan, thank you. And Michael third. Okay. Um, all in favor of approving the minutes? Yes. Aye. Aye. Any abstentions? No. Okay. Is that good enough, Dana? That was okay? Yes. <laughs> all right. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. Then moving on. This is one benefit of the last meeting only being a week ago. I would like uh, the board to consider personnel items 1 through 14. Only 14. Can I have a second on that? Second. Layla, I saw your hand first. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, sorry for the giggle. Um, and uh, Dr. Dolan, I believe there is one item for your, you to come in. There is. There is. Tonight I'm announcing with regret the retirement of Irene Hayden. For the last three years, Irene has been one of the library media specialists at the high school. She's a valued collaborator with teachers in all departments and co plans lessons with them, utilizing the library's resources, programs, and technology. And uh, as an advisor to the high school's book club and as an active member of the No Place for Hate Committee, Irene is an integral member of the high school community and she will be missed. Great, thank you. Um, no other comments? Um, I think a uh, roll call, right, Dana? Yes, Sahara Aziz? Yes. Mike Beelan? Yes. Brendan Galligan? Yes. Rob Garrison? Yes. Layla Morelli? Yes. Gretchen Oleg? Tara Porto? Yes. Sonal Patel? Yes. Amy Root? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, moving along, there hasn't been a lot of time for committees, but um, Mike, uh, facilities? No, Any we, comments? Had, we gave her update last week. There's been no meeting since. Uh, your meeting will have an update, but nothing this week. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right. Uh, perhaps similarly, long range planning, Gretchen? Yeah, no okay. for tonight. Thank you. No for tonight. Okay. Thanks. 
All right, uh, policies, Brendan. Uh, first, I ask the board to approve policy item number one. Can I have a second? Second. Thank you, Layla. Uh, this is to approve for first reading uh, the following policies 0145 board member resignation and removal. That's a board bylaw and 7510 use of school facilities. That's just a regular policy. Uh, any questions? Uh, they were attached to the agenda and sent out on Friday. All right, Shannon. Sahara Aziz. Yes. Mike Bevan. Yes. Ending Galligan. Yes. Rob Garrison. Yes. Layla Marley. Yes. Gretchen Oleg. Yes. Tara Aporto. Sonal Patel. Yes. Amy Root. Sorry, yes, I lost yep. it before. <laughs> I saw your finger. <laughs> yes. Thumb, thumb up. Not a finger. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Uh, there was going to be an addendum on today's agenda uh, until Phil Murphy's announcement yesterday. Uh, we were going to. There was supposed to be a resolution asking the governor to prioritize teachers into the vaccine, uh, the next vaccine cohort. Uh, his the, the work that various education associations, the NJEA, the NJSBA. ASBO and the ASA have all done phenomenal work to make sure that our teachers get represented and we can get our teachers back in the classroom. Uh, so that resolution is not necessary. Um, and lastly, the policies committee is meeting tomorrow briefly to discuss uh, possible calendar options with the two leftover snow days. Great. Okay, thanks. And just uh, for those who are still watching, that's the power of people getting involved and in lobbying uh, state uh, state officials to help uh, indicate the kinds of um, things that are priorities to the rest of us out here. So um, that is helpful and good to know. Um, uh, all right, moving on. Um, let's see. Uh, it's me. Curriculum. Um, I would like the board to cur consider curriculum item number one. Can I have a second, please? Second. Thank you, Tara. Saw your hand first. Oop, sorry. Um, all right, it's uh, to approve for second reading the curricula that was introduced last week, the three high school science classes, chemistry one, chemistry one honors and chemistry concepts. And then the, um, the new course in technology, engineering and design, the makerspace one semester um, elective class. Uh, all of those are high school level classes. Um, so any comments? Yeah, Amy, just one thing about the what? makerspace course. Uh, I read the description. Yes. Completely, and it sounds like a very good course that's really going to just be something new for the students. I wish I could take it, but it was uh, mm -hmm. it's a very well designed course. I, I wanted to also, I yeah. go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, I just wanted to echo no, no, what just... Mike said. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, good, good. Um, and just uh, as, a, as a plug to uh, board members and any future potential board members out there, being on curriculum is as a uh, a wonderful way to get some insight into uh, the classes that are offered in, in the district. So, and there are quite a number of them where I have that same thought, Mike, of, boy, I wish I could take this one. So, right, and, um, and you know, because, we, we'll the Amy, oh, yeah. because we have a lot of parents still on the call, uh, check that out, Makerspace, in case you got a high school kid. <laughs> I'm, I'm very excited to see the expansion of that department at the high school level. Uh, we started with some STEM classes, well, at the middle school level before that they were technology classes and woodshop and there were a lot of classes that have evolved into what is now our stem department but i'm glad to see things uh coalescing around current technologies yep okay uh dana go ahead please sahara z's yes mike Beelan. yes brendan galligan yes rob garrison yes layla morelli yes Gretchen Oleg? Yes. Tara Porto? Yes. Sonal Patel? Yes. Amy Root? Yes. Thanks very much. Um, and curriculum uh, instruction SIP has our next meeting on Thursday morning at nine o'clock. So there'll be more, more to share at our next meeting. Thanks. Um, finance, Rob? Yes, thank you. Uh, I have items uh, one through five uh, this evening. Can I get a second? Second. Um, Sonal, thank you. Um, sorry, Brent. Uh, I will point out a couple things on here, especially for the new members. Uh, and Dana um, 
talked about this in her uh, notes prior to this meeting. So resolution, uh, the first item on the on the agenda is resolution authorizing contracts with vendors through cooperative purchasing agreements. Uh, I've mentioned this once or twice in the past, I think even this year, is that the, the um, state allows school boards to be part of these cooperative purchasing um, uh, entities. And so from time to time, periodically, uh, we do in fact then have revolution, uh, resolutions beforehand that maybe some would think we would bid out, but that's already something that's been vetted through these purchasing cooperative purchasing uh, entities. And so at the beginning of the year, we approve the list of those uh, cooperatives that we're part of, and then that allows Dana's business administrator to then um, go through and uh, put forward uh, resolutions to approve such as tonight, which is the purchase of some furniture. Uh, and then the other uh, two other, actually, I'm sorry, three other uh, shout outs of uh, resolution uh, or the item number three is a gift of $4,052.26 from the Westfield Coalition for the Arts to partially fund lighting units for the West Auditorium. We accepting a gift in the amount of $379. Uh, from the Westfield High School PTSO to be used to purchase a chair to present it to a teacher at Senior Awards Night. And, and the third gift uh, that we have tonight is in the amount of $9,275 STEM books for Franklin Elementary School students. So again, we, we thank everyone, uh, both the PTOs, PTSOs, PTCs for their involvement and, and also those individuals who uh, make these type of contributions to the district. Ready for a vote? Roll call, please. <laughs> Sahara Aziz? Yes. Mike Bielan? Yes. Sunny Galligan? Yes. Rob Garrison? Yes. Layla Morelli? Yes. Gretchen Oleg? Yes. Tara Porto? Yes. Sonal Patel? Yes. Amy Root? Yes. Uh, and we, we do have a finance committee meeting set up for this Friday. Uh, and I know that next, we will, next Friday. Oh, I'm sorry, next well, Friday. Uh, so we will certainly talk about a number of items, including um, the governor's budget and how it impacts the the, the district directly. And uh, Dana will then proceed with uh, giving uh, another presentation or a more detailed presentation on our budget at the at the next meeting. So thank you, Dana, for all your work. Great, thank you, Rob. Uh, thank you, Dana. Um, or everything you do regarding the budget. Thank you. Um, technology, Gretchen, anything to share tonight? No report tonight. No report. Okay. All right. Uh, I would like board to consider the notes for the record. Um, do we have any unfinished business? Any new business to address? Uh, any liaison reports tonight? I don't have a report, but I would like to say that I have been in touch with the Lincoln PTO uh, since the last meeting and, and also prior to that, just to see if they did want me to know anything to share. And I just wanted to reiterate to the entire Lincoln community that I am completely listening and hearing your concerns and I'm committed to working with Dr. Dolan and the restart committee to figure out if there's anything that we can do to increase that in person time I had four kids go to Lincoln and I, I know how valuable it is. And I also know how great Lincoln is and I want you to get to have that experience. I want your kids to get to be there and to have that in-person time. So if there's anything that can possibly be done, I'm sure that Dr. Dolan will find it. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, all right, uh, this is the second portion of the meeting where um, we recognize the public for comments. Same process as before, Brian will open the Q&A session of the, uh, of the presentation. If you're calling in, there's a star three raise your hand function, I believe. Um, once Brian identifies you, he will unmute your microphone um, and we will hear your comments for three minutes. Okay, we have Liz Mulholland. Liz, hang on a second and I'll unmute you your microphone. Okay, you're unmuted and you have three minutes. Please state your name and address. Hi, Liz Mulholland, 1029 Harding Street. 
How are you guys tonight? Um, I wanted to thank you all for all the hard work you do. As you know, uh, for those who know me, I am um, also in a public ed advocacy group and we are fighting alongside you guys. And I am sorry that um, unfortunately a lot of the public don't realize how little control you have over these issues and that you have to follow the state laws, the state policy and the state guidelines. Um, um, as you know, the teachers have now recently gotten approval for vaccinations and uh, we did pass around a petition. Um, I think that it would also be helpful for testing. I know that that was a recommendation and I hope that the district will get that as well so that you can further open up. Um, I'm fully aware of all of the issues you're having. And I'm sorry um, that the public isn't more aware of just how hard you've been working as somebody who goes to the PTO meetings uh, PTC meetings and follows you on the board. I do appreciate all the hard work you've put through and hopefully these um, vaccinations will help to open up the schools a little more. Um, I wanted to talk more about the budget. Uh, I read the, I watched the budget um, presentation and I noticed that we are running at a little bit of a deficit. So I was wondering um, if we can open up for lunch at some point later on is there some funding that the parents can do to help the district? Because I see that uh, the budget is very tight this year. And I know that these things are very costly, um, the plexiglass and if there's gonna be tents. I know that there was one district, only one district your size that was able to open up and they had to purchase classes, uh, portable classrooms, which I imagine are very expensive. Um, so if there is something maybe we can do to help fundraise for that uh, in the event that September, this is an issue. Um, I'd love to, to, you know, help with that. So that's just my recommendation. Again, thank you so much for everything you do. I appreciate it. Thank you, Liz. Thanks for the comments and for the, uh, for the constructive thinking and, um. We'll definitely try to get word out as soon as uh, as soon as we can if, if an opportunity like that were to arise. So thank you, Brian. Next we have uh, Rob Benaccio. Rob, I'll unmute you now. You have three minutes, and please state your name and address. Sure, uh, Rob Benaccio, five twenty eight Forest Avenue in Westfield. Uh, I had a couple of questions actually. Um, first, uh, at the end of uh, last week's meeting. I was about 11.30, 11.45, which I know you were all aware, uh, and I did stay on for that. Um, there were, I had some questions that I had asked about the superintendent search uh, and requested information regarding the, uh, the success rate of the school board's association in finding new superintendents uh, in the criteria that they are going to use in their process in, uh, in the superintendent search. And whether or not a parent council could be formed to uh, be part of that search process. I have not seen any response to those questions and I'd request uh, that that occur. Um, the next thing uh, is I had seen some uh, on the agenda, there were some policies, uh, particularly 7510 regarding the use of school facilities. Um, it's a little bit difficult to determine whether or not those policies are new or if those policies are being proposed with changes. So I'd like to request or suggest that when policies are, are posted, uh, and maybe I just can't see it on the website, uh, that to the extent that they're being revised, that you redline those revisions, because I'd be very interested to see precisely what changes were being made to that policy, or if it's something new. Uh, I think that would be very helpful. Uh, I'm particularly interested in that as someone who is involved in coaching and uh, is involved in leagues that do use the school facilities. So I'd want to make sure that I understand fully uh, what that's about. Uh, and the last thing I'd like to discuss is the budget itself. Uh, I know at your last meeting there were, there appeared to be what was a 3.2 million dollar deficit in the budget. Uh, I know the governor announced some new funding, and I'd be particularly interested in understanding how that new funding might be applied to close that gap. Uh, and I hadn't planned on commenting on this, but uh, your most recent speaker commented that, um, sh that parents in some way should perhaps contribute to this funding gap. Uh, I couldn't possibly disagree with that more considering the amount of taxes that we pay for the school district and considering that so many programs, including school plays, et cetera, have been canceled 
um, that were previously budgeted for. And I find comments like that to be extraordinarily tone deaf that that parents should pay more taxes. Uh, I understand. Thirty seconds. Thank you. I understand the person is a political activist, and, and that's kind of where we Rob, have gone. Please, uh, as part of this public comment, I'm sorry. I, I'd like to finish my three minutes thing. No, Rob. Um, unfortunately, during the public comment period, you're not allowed to refer to nor speak against anyone that that was a previous speaker. So please keep your comments focused towards the board. Thank you. Oh, that's perfectly fine. Uh, I disagree with uh, utilizing any parent funding for that. And my question is, how are we going to repurpose the funding? That was utilized that was previously allocated to other activities uh, to uh, to fund those budget gaps and why can't we do that to fund lunches and other other issues. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. Um, there will be a more fulsome um, budget presentation next week when we'll be voting um, and work is continuing to close the gap and um, I'm sure we'll hear more from Dana next week. Um, as to your other comments, uh, there will not be public participation on our search committee. It's been impressed upon us that um, absolute confidentiality is is very important. Um, and it, that question has been asked at a, a you asked it last week, but uh, it's been asked in a different venue as well, and the same response was given there. So the survey that's gone out to the community and the public meeting um, that will be held la next week um, is are the, the avenues for, for the public to comment on criteria for the search. Yep. Uh, as to the success rate of uh, New Jersey School Boards Association, uh, they've placed over 60 superintendents in the last four years in districts. And the statewide average uh, currently for superintendents to stay in their position is less than three years. Um, we've been very lucky in a district like Westfield that we are the, the capstone of a superintendent's career. Uh, we're not a small K to five district. We're not, we're not a rural district. Uh, when superintendents come to us, it tends to be. 1 of the last parts of their career. It's not a stepping stone along the way. Um, I know that's not exactly what you asked, but the, the state. Average and success rates aren't necessarily indicative because of the diversity of districts across the state. Okay, thanks. Uh, Brian, who's next? Uh, we don't have anyone else. Okay. And that's uh, it's good to hear. I'm just going back to my agenda. Then I would make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Do I have a second? Second. Tara, thank you. And so no, the vote, voice vote. Thank you. Uh, all right. All in favor of adjournment? Aye. 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 Yes, good. Any, uh, any, uh, any nays? No, I didn't think so. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, thanks for all the public input, everyone. Um, and, uh, we'll see you all at our next meeting in 2 weeks. Have a good night. Everybody. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you.